I'm pleased to know that uh, coming all the way here and talking with uh, people who know friends and uh, we were just chatting over Frisch. Uh, and uh, Uriel Frisch is the, <laughs> is, uh, is the person who should be quoted for this observation. I mentioned before Cauchy. Cauchy's discovery of 1815, uh, and then a few years later as well. This is, uh, there is a, a, a very nice paper, a recent paper, or a series of papers, by uh, Uriel Frisch. And uh, um, Barbara uh, Villone. And it's about history. It's about history, but it's very beautiful. It's a paper, I don't know, <laughs> 2014, 14 maybe, something like this. And Uriel Frisch has a wonderful book on turbulence. It's a very compact book on turbulence I would recommend you to have. It's, a, it's a one of the important books of recent, uh, of recent uh, years. Uh, well, it's no longer recent. Uh, the book is uh, now maybe uh, 20 years, uh, 15 years old. Okay. So we go back to Helmholtz. And uh, in this paper, it's a big paper. Uh, he has uh, uh, the conservation laws for vortex dynamics. And uh, again, uh, I consistently with what I'm doing for the rest of this uh, course, I will uh, focus more on concepts rather than going through these uh, equations. And the concepts uh, sometimes are uh, kind of missing in books because books report uh, this equation without paying attention maybe to... Uh, aspects that now we care about, and uh, I will tell you what I mean in a second. So let me state uh, the conservation law. So um, this is uh, Helmholtz, Helmholtz uh, conservation law. So we have three laws. Uh, let's say that uh, for uh, isotropic flow, vortex, oops, vortex uh, uh, motion is uh, uh, governed by. This equation, that equation, and also um, the following conservation laws. The first is uh, irrotational. Uh, fluid particle, fluid uh, particles. Irrotational meaning curl equals zero at time, at time t zero remain irrotational uh, uh, for all subsequent. times uh, the second law states that uh, uh, a vortex line uh, is a material line made uh, by the same particles 
uh, at all times. And the third law, third law is uh, the flux of vorticity. The flux of vorticity uh, of any portion of a vortex tube. Uh, is uh, is constant is constant in time uh, now these vortex laws are um, are presented in basically all books on uh, fluid mechanics and vortex dynamics but uh, uh, it is, uh, and uh, and uh, you can, uh, you know, for example, in Safman's book, you have a very nice uh, proof of these books, of these uh, laws. But it's very, actually, nobody mentioned uh, something that I think is important. First of all, these two laws are about qualitative properties. They do not state anything quantitative. They say that a fluid made by irrotational particles uh, is irrotational and stays irrotational. The particles that are irrotational are going to remain irrotational for any time. And uh, now you think of this. You have a vortex here, and uh, my suggestion is... Uh, well, of course, infinitely long with an axis, maybe here, and your field lines inside. And you, I, I, my suggestion is to think uh, this is a vortex, and you, you think of the complement of this vortex, okay? So you start thinking, okay, there is a vortex and there is a complement of this vortex. Why I'm emphasizing this? Because I invite you to think to remove the vortex, from the fluid, and you would have a fluid with holes, like black holes. So you would have a fluid with uh, complexity, topological complexity, hmm? multiply connected domain. So you start to have this view, and if you have this view, these laws are uh, very simple. One says that a region here, that uh, is uh, irrotational, stays irrotational at all times, and the region here that is rotational remains irrotational for all times. So is a statement about uh, the same object, if you like. Uh, either I talk about the complement space or I talk about the object itself. I define the object, hence I define uh, the complement space by default. And so I'm saying that uh, uh, this uh, property, the property, say, of vorticity, stays there forever, no matter how I deform it. So it's a topological statement. This is uh, just uh, the two laws are saying that uh, given uh, some uh, vortex uh, tube with a given uh, shape, given geometry, no matter how it deforms, how matter, no matter how this geometry, this shape deforms, the region that uh, uh, are hosting the vorticity remain vortical. So it's a topological statement. Indeed, there is no quantitative statement here. Here we have a statement about quantity. It says that the flux which you measure is constant in time. So the third law is very different from the first two laws. And the first two laws, you could condense the, the first two laws in one law. It's about topological conservation of a certain quantity. Now, uh, okay, you can, uh, you can, in order to prove uh, these things, you have to define a region 
of vorticity, where vorticity is localized. You can think of a tube, a tubular region, and then you start saying, okay, here the curl is zero, here the curl is different from zero, and you start building your information. Uh, so I'm not going to prove these laws. Uh, um, There's not particularly difficult. Uh, in uh, Safman's book, uh, you, uh, a trick is used, a conceptual trick is used, uh, and uh, you think uh, of uh, vorticity omega as a vector, and then you consider each component, and each component, then you start treating each component as a scalar quantity, each component as if it were something, I don't know, like temperature, a scalar. And you you want to point out that if a material line, say ink, is colored, instead of ink is one component of vorticity, he stayed colored at all times. Why? You reduce the uh, equations, those ones, you reduce the equation on a material line, as we did it already. Uh, the Lagrangian derivative becomes uh, uh, the ordinary derivative, and then you appeal to the uh, existence and uniqueness of the theory, uh, theory of existence and uniqueness solution of ordinary differential equations. And so if it stays, uh, uh, if it is uh, colored blue, it stays colored blue for all time. If it is not colored blue, it is not colored blue at all times, etc. So if it is a vorticity defined there through these uh, three components, you end up with a set of three different ordinary differential equations, and they say that vorticity stays there at all time on the material line, on that material line. So material particle, uh, if they have vorticity, they keep to have it for uh, later times. It similarly, is done the, the, the second, uh, the, the first law. This is the, first, the second law. The first law is done similarly. Uh, you, you construct uh, uh, a material line where you define that the lack of a certain property and the lack of a certain property by the theory of ordinary differential equation is uh, uh, con considered as a solution. It survives at all times. It stays there. Uh, the, the flux of vorticity, any portion of tube, is uh, also uh, basically intuitively proven by Stokes' theorem or antiliteram because Helmholtz didn't use Stokes' theorem. But what I'd like to remark here is the comment that I made. And so, you know, you divide the proof, uh, you take a portion, the flux, uh, the flux of vorticity, or any portion. So you take a portion, say, this portion of a tube, and then on this portion of a tube, you, uh, you just pay attention to the surface, to the surface and you pay attention to the fact that vorticity has a normal component to the surface that is zero everywhere around this uh, tubular surfaces except here and entering here. And then the volume integral, you reduce the volume integral to the surface integral because uh, through uh, this boundary there is no vorticity flux. All the flux is here and here. And then uh, you can uh, reduce this if you call this is uh, sigma 1 and this is uh, sigma 2. Then uh, you have uh, simply that the integral on uh, sigma 1 of omega nu normal to the surface uh, d2 uh, dx is, is uh, uh, you, you do the, uh, the, the volume integration is given by uh, the sum with a minus side because it's entering uh, on uh, sigma 2 of omega dot nu d2x. And this is just uh, the integral. When you reduce this uh, to the same and you bring it to the volume, uh, this is just the divergence. Uh, this is the curl. Uh, through nu, you apply the divergence theorem, and this is the divergence of omega in d3x. Uh, where W is the volume, W is just the volume, volume of uh, vortex tube. Remember, we have no vorticity. There is nothing here when uh, vorticity goes through the surface. We are left uh, with this and this. Then we apply uh, this uh, uh, transform to the volume, and the volume. The integral over the volume is the divergence of vorticity. 
So this is zero. This is zero simply because the divergence of vortices is the divergence is the divergence of the curve of something, which is always zero. Okay, whatever. Whatever you put here. Well, in particular, you. Okay? So because of this property, this is zero. It means uh, that all this is zero. We have no flux of vorticity through, the, through the, uh, the tubular boundary, only through the surfaces. So we can conclude that if this is zero, then uh, this is equal to that. And if this is equal to that, then the flux, no matter how, is uh, sigma, is uh, defined that way. Now, clearly, you have here a way to define a flux. So let's, uh, let's, let's call it phi. Then you can use uh, Stokes' theorem, and you identify this flux of vorticity with circulation of U around this uh, tube. C and uh, U. Like so. Okay. Um, so from there you have also the fact uh, you have also the fact that uh, if you shrink, since uh, phi is constant, uh, you shrink uh, the tube, the intensity increases because the product of the tube has to remain constant. All right. Uh, now, I mentioned uh, Cauchy, and uh, so Cauchy is behind this uh, because we have uh, also a lemma due to Cauchy. Let's say Cauchy, uh, maybe I'm wrong to call them solutions, but you will see in a moment why I call them co uh, Cauchy solutions. I want to show that uh, for isentropic is an entropic uh, uh, flow, vorticity is uh, transport. Is uh, transported by the flow. According to the following. Uh, omega of rho is uh, dx dx zero, the Jacobian of uh, omega over rho, sorry, um, at time zero. And then I want to add, uh, well, of course, uh, time zero, the zero indicates the initial position. Uh, the equations, these equations are solutions to uh, the vorticity transport equation that we saw there, hmm? star. Okay, this is interesting because, again, something that was done in 1815, perhaps, and that wasn't considered interesting, interesting uh, is now quite interesting. Uh, when I say it wasn't considered interesting, I mean uh, uh, conserved quantities. It's amazing for us. You know, we pay so much attention to conservation laws, to conserve quantities. You know, if you run into something that is conserved, wow, fantastic. You can, uh, first thing, maybe you, you, you think, maybe not myself, but, uh, uh, oh, can, I, can, I can implement in a computer and I can control. If you demonstrate that this is conserved, you can use it as a check if your simulation is uh, consistently conserving total mass energy, momentum, something like that. 
So it's quite amazing to us now to say that at the time the academy in Paris didn't pay attention to the fact that he was interested in proving conservation of certain things. And he himself, of course, realized that. So he didn't make a, a big uh, thing of it. He just, in passing, he said, oh, by the way, this is the case. Here we see something already that, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's interesting. We have, uh, I could stop here and uh, just uh, relax and pay attention to what, I, what is written without going to prove anything, just spending time there. We have something, something, a distribution of a vorticity, a field somewhere, at time equals zero, that is multiplied by this Jacobian. And this Jacobian is, uh, everything is smooth, right? Everything is smooth. It's a combination of derivatives. So there are lots of derivatives there. Everything is smooth. Uh, we say analytic. And so, we, of course, everything is continuous. So if I have something here that is in the shape of a knot, then it can be deformed, how much we want, but it will be, it will be mapped to the, the same knot type. The knot will change geometry, but the same topology. If, the, if there is some topology here, some non-trivial topology here, it will be transported in time by the flow map. And all this emphasis I'm putting is amazing in a sense because if you, if you just pause and change your mind a little bit, you are saying, well, of course, a fluid motion is about topology. It's the same thing. If as long as you allow continuous deformation, this is a fluid mechanics, continuous deformation. I can emphasize the same on plastiline, and, you know, on, uh, on elastic uh, mechanics, or mechanics of, a la of uh, flexible bodies. And I could say, as long as I don't cut uh, the structure, uh, then uh, whatever I do with it, I will uh, deform it, but uh, uh, substantially topology will remain the same. So this is just uh, an amazing uh, uh, observation that uh, probably Cauchy could, uh, could do at the time. But nobody was interested, so he didn't do it. Or if he did it, he kept it for himself. So I will, I will just uh, uh, manage to show you the second statement. Um, well, the first statement over there, because I assumed, uh, uh, I assumed uh, um, the, um, the fact that uh, the Jacobian, the flow map, is uh, it has an inverse, everything is continuous. <coughs> I can say this, I can say, well, suppose you take an element of a vortex filament or vortex line, you take an element, let me call it delta L, and suppose this is a piece on, is a material line of a vortex, so it's a curl different from zero, then I can just rewrite this uh, standardly as this, arc length, and uh, this is dx over ds by definition of, uh, of arc length. And uh, this is just, uh, I want to recover, I want to go back to the original, uh, to the original uh, state. And so I have on dx uh, and I construct the matrix, the Jacobian matrix. So I have to multiply and divide by these dx, uh, these differentials, uh, the, uh, the position time t equals zero. Uh, and then when I'm there, I'm, I'm done because uh, you see here is a dx over uh, dx uh, zero. And all this is uh, multiplied by uh, the element, sorry, and this is multiplied by the element uh, delta L zero. Delta L and delta L zero are just uh, talking to each other through this Jacobian, and this is nothing else than what is written there. It's simply, I, you know, if you go to the differential, you are happier, you see this, and 
you think you do the other way around. You think that this differential is an element of a vortex, and then you identify this element of whatever line is with the vortex line. So you can do the same for whatever field you like, because this is just the geometry, if you like. There's no field mechanics in this. So you take uh, whatever, magnetic field, blah, there, and else there. So you have uh, this uh, statement to relate the topology of the initial state uh, to the final state, or better, uh, the final state to the initial state. All right, uh, so we have, uh, uh, of course, here, uh, in this case, uh, as I did before, I should stress that this is my Jacobian matrix. Hmm? It's not the determinant. Okay, so for the second statement, these equations are solutions to the vorticity transport equations. You have to tell, uh, you have to take d, dt of uh, omega over rho, and uh, this is uh, d dt uh, Lagrangian Lee of uh, we. Go back to the original state, so dx, uh, dx uh, zero times uh, omega zero of a row, and then uh, we work out the velocity from this because this is the derivative of x is the velocity. So we have uh, the transformation of u with respect to the initial uh, position. Uh, so this is also a matrix, and uh, this is times omega over rho at the initial stage. Um, all right, so this we can, can go on. We have du over dx, dx, dx zero, times uh, omega over rho, zero. You know where I'm going. And uh, this is uh, du dx uh, times dx d zero. The Jacobian uh, times omega over rho over rho zero. So this is rho, basically, omega over rho, du over dx times uh, omega over rho. So we have just to rearrange the last uh, term. Okay, so by rearranging the last term, we have the dt of uh, omega of a row is equal to d u uh, dx Jacobian omega of a row, and this is omega of a row times the grad of, uh, of u. Okay, so uh, Cauchy solutions uh, satisfy, Cauchy uh, equations satisfy uh, the, uh, the equation of transport of vorticity. Uh, we say briefly, uh, very briefly, that whatever is omega and not a link, etc., uh, is uh, in the same topological class of omega zero. So if this is a knot, this is the same knot. If this is a link, this is the same link. There's nothing that can uh, uh, change the topology during evolution. When I say there is nothing, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm neglecting viscosity, I'm neglecting all these effects that are very important. So you start thinking of one other thing. 
you start thinking that uh, topology is conserved is a world where there is no time, so to speak. The time, the dynamical time of the evolution, yes, is there. But if you think of time in terms of entropy, in terms of entropy, change of topology, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which of course uh, is uh, is crucial, uh, then is a strange situation here. There is an evolution preserving topology as, as, as soon as you put in dissipative effects, you have real time. So you can decouple the two things. Now, you, why you want to decouple the two things? Well, you want to decouple the two things. Well, one simple example, one simple reason. Well, if you hit by a tornado, it's so intense that as long as it's uh, alive, makes uh, trouble to everybody. So in a sense, uh, compared to other uh, forces of nature, uh, you can see that this evolution as if it was uh, frozen in, uh, in a fluid. In, a, in, other, in other words, uh, if it were, uh, you consider this, this evolution as if uh, dissipative effects that would calm down this tornado would not be present. One other way to think about this is that uh, topology matters uh, as long as uh, there is some energy localized and this energy prevails on other energies. So as long as this is the case, you may think that topology tells you a lot. Now there are situations more abstract where you can like to have uh, topology conserved. Well, there is one case. I can say, I can think of my wife. And uh, when I ask her to write something, I'm in trouble. Big trouble. I cannot read. I cannot read her, her writings. You know, uh, you say, well, Renzo, what is talking about? I'm talking about the old times when you went to a bank. I, I, I guess nobody goes into a bank now. I, I never went to a bank. It is now several years with the internet, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I come to internet, to internet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Nobody goes to a bank anymore. But suppose you go to a bank and you, you know, you ask to sign something, and you ask, and I sign this. You know, I asked, I sign this, and they're happy. They're happy. But if, if I do this, they are not happy. Suppose I am the same person. Why they are not happy? Because they cannot recognize my name. You have to recognize something. When you go from here to here, you are allowed to do this. We are always doing this. We are not signing exactly the same thing. We are not stamping down something. But when we are doing from this to this, uh, there is a moment... There is a kind of transition that uh, you cannot go over. Because if you go over, the people say, well, I do, not, I do not recognize what you are writing. What I'm saying is that if I want to communicate something to you, I have to transmit some information. And this information can be transmitted only if I conserve, during my message, some elements that are considered to be important. And this important element is, uh, can you, you, know, you can call it signature information. You know, the signature information is preserved. It's a conserved quantity. I can deform it as much as I want it up to a point. Because at a certain point there is a transition where this information gets eroded or gets changed dissipated, uh, uh, manipulated, so that I cannot recognize it anymore. But this sounds familiar to the guys, the young guys. Hmm? Is communication technology. We have to send an information that, of course, can be encoded and decoded, but we want to have a signal, an information, that is uh, preserving a quantity. And uh, up to now, we've talked about that. Conservation laws, all the time, all the time. Cauchy was not important at the time. Probably if you needed money, they were looking at your face. They were recognizing you and they were giving you the money. But now it's important because they don't know the faces. 
And if you need money, you have to encode some information so that that is recognized. No? So I, I, I just bought a, I, I bought, I gave, a, it is free of charge, but I gave a, a debit card to my, to my, to my son recently, uh, free of charge, so it's not a big effort. Then he complained there was no money on the card. This is a different story. And, uh, and everything was done through face recognition. Everything. Online, face recognition. And then they even asked me to redo the take because the face was not properly identified, probably by some computer, with the face I had on an identity card. Because they took a snapshot of the identity card, then the face recognition from my, my home, and then a bank uh, who knows where, maybe in China or in a remote island in the Pacific, then they decided that I was allowed to have this debit card. Whatever happened was uh, through uh, an exchange of information, and what is crucial here is that is a topological conservation law. It doesn't matter the geometry, but some key features must be conserved. Whatever is the manipulation. Of course, this is very, very important for data analysis and for cryptography. That's why it was so important a few years back, maybe still now, uh, information on, you know, there was a lot of work on solitons and integrable system. Integrable system are infinitely many conservation laws associated with integrability. And if you, if you manage to send a signal on a so-called uh, integrable system, then the, there is no noise that dissipates the information. And if there is some noise, it's so little compared to the conservation laws that uh, are used in that uh, system, an integrable system, that um, uh, the second order, uh, uh, informa- a second order approximation. So here we are talking about this signature preserving uh, transformations. Now the last bit, of today, I will end up, uh, maybe I decide, I keep, uh, it's better not to mix too many topics, I already do uh, when I talk. Um, so it's about helicity. I want to end up today with the conservation of uh, kinetic helicity. So I have to introduce helicity. And I said, remember what I said at the beginning, I said that, uh, I said that, uh, this is uh, just a rather recent uh, discovery because uh, kinetic helicity and magnetic helicity that we see tomorrow um, have been uh, found to be conserved in, uh, in the 50s, uh, in the 60, 58 and 61. Uh, so let's say in the 60s. And uh, from the 60s, uh, then uh, many, many other things came, and more specifically, the topological, the topological interpretation of, of helicity that uh, came from, from Keith Moffat's work in Cambridge. Actually, it wasn't in Cambridge at the time. Once uh, we were talking, and he mentioned, I don't know how, if it is, you know, it's already many, many years ago. I was uh, his student, and so maybe I'm, I'm misquoting what he told me. But uh, because uh, I was Italian, he said, well, you know, Renzo, actually, the idea of helicity came when we were visiting Italy. And uh, I visited uh, Sicily in Palermo, and then we spent some time uh, as a young, uh, young people in the, in the, in the hills, uh, uh, near Torino, near Turin, <coughs> and uh, is uh, between Sicily and uh, Turin that uh, came this idea of maybe he was kind to me, so he just said that he invented the story just to please me. I don't know. Um, <coughs> so helicity, <coughs> helicity. Uh, so kinetic helicity um, was. Uh, the conservation of kinetic helicity um, there are two people and they tend to mix up uh, the two people one worked on kinetic helicity and the other on magnetic helicity one is Voltier Voltier uh, 1958 
and the other is Moro. Moro, 1961. One on vortex, the other on, uh, on magnetic. Uh, <coughs> I will talk about uh, helicity, so I have to define helicity first. Helicity. So, kinetic helicity. Uh, um, is defined by uh, this quantity H. I will take it as a function of time for the moment, integral on a particular region W that now you recognize being the region of vorticity because I used uh, these symbols to distinguish uh, the regions of vorticity from regions of irrotational fluid. And this is D3X. And so I will put a star just to remind us that th this X is a, a point in W, and this W is for simplicity. Think of a vortex tube, an infinitely long vortex tube where these lines are just denote uh, vector lines of vorticity. So remember, first thing is uh, remember that uh, the integral is on the vorticity domain because U is... Uh, associated with vorticity because of Biot-Savart law, but this domain is not outside, it's inside the tube. Okay, so this is the definition of helicity, and uh, uh, we want to prove conservation of helicity. Conservation theorem. Uh, conservation of helicity. Uh, there is a review paper by Keith Moffat on, uh, on this, um, 2014, uh, Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences of USA, where he, I think he's in that paper, I'm not so sure, but uh, anyway, he's uh, referring to uh, somebody I met personally uh, many times uh, when I was pretty young. My mother is from Geneva, and... Uh, and so I visited Geneva in Switzerland many times. And at a certain point when I was uh, already in Cambridge, but pretty young, 20, 25, I, I knew somebody in Geneva who was retired there, and his name is Robert Betchoff. And Betchoff is uh, famous for certain equations uh, that are dealing with uh, solitons and uh, um, uh, their relationship with the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. This is a different story. But because of his interest with solitons, I was interested in solitons, so I, 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 I met him. Uh, and I remember Keith asking me, how, how did you find him? And well, uh, at the time, it was even easier than now. You, you went to a phone book, and you check Betchov. Betchov is, is an easy name to find in Switzerland or in Geneva. So he was the only Betchov in Geneva. I called, and he was him. Uh, he spent his life in uh, in uh, in United States, actually, and uh, Betchov was very very interested in this uh, helicity, and uh, uh, he had troubles with the memory because he underwent an operation, etc. etc. But he was telling me that this idea was already in one of his paper, 1961. So you see, very close to these years. And even more interesting is the fact that Keith Moffat's work was 1969. It came later, of course, than these findings. So Betchoff was very much interested because he was interested in turbulence and the role of three-dimensionality in turbulence. And we will see here how is important the role of three-dimensionality in fluids and, of course, uh, the topological interpretation that Keith Moffat uh, gave to helicity. So the statement is uh, very simple. Is dH dt equals zero, so that H is actually a constant of motion. All right. So dH, so let's say proof, uh, I will prove to you the conservation of magnetic helicity as well. 
And uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, somebody will laugh at what I'm saying, but uh, I, I, uh, I, find, uh, I find amazing that uh, the difficulty due to the, uh, to the Faraday law for vorticity is reverted here. The proof for kinetic helicity is quite simple, straightforward, but for magnetic fields and for magnetic helicity is a little bit more convoluted. So we will see it tomorrow. Anyway, so we go like this, dh, <coughs> dt, is just d dt of the definition over w, u, omega, d3x. And then we, this is a material volume made of particles that remain rotational at all times. So we get inside d dt and uh, u, u uh, dot omega. Sorry, I should have put uh, this star. Maybe I'm, I'm now forgetting it. Anyway, so we have uh, uh, integral on this uh, w du dt times uh, omega plus uh, u dot uh, d omega dt in d3x star. And then we apply Euler's equation, du dt. Hmm? We have Euler's equation, and then we need d omega dt that uh, I'm afraid I inadvertently er uh, um, erased. Uh, so we have... Uh, 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 integral minus 1 over rho grad p times omega. I forgot to say something important about the definition of helicity, uh, but uh, I, I will say it in a moment. It should be there, though. So apologies for this. I forgot to say something about the domain of definition of vorticity. I'll come back to that when it's time. Plus u dot omega dot grad u. And this is uh, on uh, d3x star. I use the, uh, the Euler's equation here and the vorticity transport equation there. And now since the div omega is equal to zero always, because it's a divergence of a curl, then we have dh dt uh, integral on w uh, omega dot grad. I put undergrad uh, whatever I can minus p over rho, and then plus uh, a half u squared, when I take the grad I have u, uh, in d3x. Okay? And this is uh, integral w of uh, grad of uh, something, omega, come out, minus p over rho, plus half u squared d3x star. Now, I use divergence theorem. And uh, I have dh dt equal integral, I go to the boundary, boundary of uh, W, P, rho, minus half uh, U squared. <coughs> okay. Um, all this divergence theorem, I consider the flux through the surface. So I have a flux of omega through new being the normal to the surface, d2x. And then, uh, to conclude, 
I need something that I omitted to say in my definition of vorticity. The definition is that uh, this uh, domain of vorticity, or the vorticity beta, is uh, such that uh, uh, the boundary of this domain is always a vortex material surface. So omega such that omega dot nu on the boundary is always zero. Okay? So if we have no flux of vorticity through this uh, bounding surface, then uh, evidently this is zero. So this is rather straightforward. I don't need much algebra. I just need the basic equations and to just uh, insert the basic equations into that. Nothing that I did here it reproduces uh, exactly the derivations that Euler, uh, Lagrange, or, or Helmholtz, or Cauchy did is the modern version, but this is exactly what uh, is uh, amounted. E tomorrow we will see the, the, the uh, proof of the conservation of uh, magnetic helicity. Uh, as I said, it's a little bit more elaborated. Uh, you need some, some uh, identity from vector algebra. Um, the relationship between the two is that u and omega, this is a function, this is a, the curl of this function. So any field, let me you know, move a little bit farther away from vorticity. Any field times the curl of the field, if this, if this integral admits a topological uh, interpretation, then the same is true for whatever field and the curl of the field defined on the domain of the curl. So the, the way I said it is exactly the way that Whitehead in 1947, 1947, you, 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 you understood right, said that, that uh, this quantity but he didn't refer to vorticity, velocity, nothing. He didn't use uh, he didn't use uh, Euler equation, as we did here, or Helmholtz equation, nothing. He said that a field times the curl of the field, the integral of that is an isotopy invariant. 1947. Meaning that is a topologically conserved quantity. Maybe you have to prove it through, uh, in fluid mechanics, uh, through uh, fluid mechanics uh, tools, but uh, the statement was already around there. Quite interesting. All right. So, uh, so yes? So this conservation law is totally, uh, has nothing to do with the uh, Helmholtz theorem. No, it has to do with uh, um, We use the Helmholtz theorem here. Um, uh, this part. The omega dt is related to this. So that is uh, what I didn't prove, Helmholtz theorem, transport of vorticity. So this theorem it also doesn't hold for uh, compressible field. Yes. Same can be said for magnetic helicity. Tomorrow we will see it more explicitly, although in a more elaborate way, the role of Faraday's law. Because again, uh, magnetic helicity I can anticipate, uh, you, you follow very well, is the integral of A dot B. A dot B. B interpreted as the curl of A. So a field times, uh, a field times uh, its curl. And again, there you need uh, to do more or less of the strategy is the same. At a certain point, it becomes a little bit more convoluted. But you need, uh, you need uh, the time, vary the transport of, uh, well, the magnetic field, and that is uh, Faraday's, and eventually the transport of the vector potential. So you have to go back to the vector potential. And that is when you need more algebra. Time derivative of the vector potential. 
but uh, substantially is the same. And um, uh, so I will duel on this analogy tomorrow. Uh, one is, as, I, as it's called, is a perfect analogy. The other one is non-perfect analogy. When I appeal to one of these two analogies, and I refer to vorticity analogous to magnetic field, is actually the non-perfect analogy. But you can do the same with another helicity. I want to uh, talk about uh, there are a number of helicities because a field times its curl. For example, magnetic field times uh, the curl of magnetic field, which you know is uh, one of the Maxwell's equation is uh, uh, current. Okay, I can I can just mention these two things. One is magnetic. Magnetic helicity. I will uh, I will talk about this tomorrow. Uh, say H uh, M, and this is the integral of A dot B B three E X star on. Uh, let me say W just to be clear. On the points on the points of B. But 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 there is also. Uh, some other helicity, I don't know the name. You know the name? Uh, uh, I can't remember the name for this one, but anyway. Uh, J uh, dot B, where B, where J is just the curl of B. This is electric current, and that is magnetic field. Sorry to the strong physicist here because I'm putting all the constants equal to one. Of course, yeah, you, you, you know, there is a mu, hmm? a permeability somewhere. Uh, one over. Say it again? Between? X plus star and the X. Ah, uh, I said it. Is, is about this. Any point inside the tube this is an X star. Any point outside the tube is an X. So the integration regards uh, the domain of definition of uh, vorticity, of uh, magnetic field, and uh, in this case, uh, this is the current, uh, so the current. So if, uh, if you have uh, currents uh, flowing in uh, fluid, and they, they form knots or links, then uh, you can attribute uh, topological meaning to this uh, type of uh, configurations. Because helicity would be conserved, and uh, I cannot anticipate too many things, but the uh, last lecture would be totally devoted to interpretation of helicity in terms of topology, of linking numbers in particular. Yes? Is <coughs> helicity a useful uh, a concept for viscous flow? <coughs> I have, um, yes, it is useful. Can you tell me why? You posed the question to me, I know, but I, I know the answer, and I want to know if we have a sense together, I mean, of... Uh, because we can always define... Uh, okay, let's, let's suppose I don't know the... I don't know. I, uh, let's, let's do it as, as an exercise, Okay. So it's a conserved quantity, right? It's a conserved quantity. But I know your point. You say, well, viscous fluid. Okay, so we have other conserved quantities, right? So, for example, I don't know, uh, energy. Is energy conserved in a viscous fluid? No. How much it is uh, dissipated? Then we can say something. We measure dissipation of energy. And we may say that uh, energy is important for some reason, right? Because it gets transferred, because it serves uh, a purpose, power, whatever. Essentially because it, can, it gets transferred. It is dissipated, but it gets transferred, transported, it gets transferred. It gets transferred a part of it. So it's important because we recognize, although we don't measure, we don't know, but we intuitively think 
that uh, you know if I throw a you know a, a boulder, a mass, and something, then this will react. If we if we throw it in the water, there will be dissipation. But uh, I mean the amount of uh, momentum I give is transferred. So we have the idea that energy in that sense is relevant, is going to be dissipated, but a great amount survives in the impulse effect. Okay, more or less is the same reasoning here. Helicity is conserved in ideal fluids. How much it gets dissipated? This is the question. Because if it is eroded instantly, well, there is not so much interest. But if it gets eroded uh, a little bit, maybe like energy, ah, that would be great. That would be important. And I'm at this stage, I am the first to tell you, I have no idea of future applications. I have no idea. But I understand its meaning. I'm like, uh, maybe like a uh, <laughs> small scale Cauchy. I, I, I recognize, we recognize the importance. I really don't know, I have some clue, but it is in the future, you know, in the future. Maybe in communications, maybe who knows. But so it is. Uh, conserved in an ideal situation. It is not conserved in real life, but in real life, the great amount of it dissipates very slowly. So how slowly then you start to compare with energy? Do they dissipate with the same scale or uh, which one is more robust to dissipation? And uh, the fact, the simple fact, that uh, you can compare the two, so they are not order of magnitudes totally different, then the simple fact that you can compare the order of magnitude is relevant. So no need to go into you know, a lot of details. This is the message. So you also mentioned uh, this T reflects some kind of the role of uh, three-dimensionality in, in uh, turbulence or in uh, so that reminded me, recently I used the concept of helicity uh, in my study of uh, collision of two droplets, or you can say collision of two bubbles. Interesting. Apparently, because before that I handled axometric problem. Apparently for axometric problem, helicity remains zero. Good. No matter it's inviscid flow or viscous flow, because simply these two vectors are orthogonal to each other. So then I suddenly realized that once I move to three-dimensional problem, the helicity just jumps up. It's not equal to zero. So I realized that maybe that can help us, help me to, to find some interesting uh, three-dimensional is, is absolutely relevant what you said. I, I of course, I just mentioned I said few things, but there's a lot to be said. One thing to be said is what you remarked, that uh, helicity is a pseudo-scalar quantity. It can distinguish re uh, left from right, and so it can be used the opposite, uh, in the opposite sense. Uh, to if you have a totally symmetric system, then uh, helicity is zero. When is zero? Hmm? I reverse the statement. When is zero? Is, is any meaning to the fact that is zero? Maybe in terms of complexity, maybe in terms of uh, uh, you know, averaging uh, left and right uh, properties of the system uh, for turbulence, for instance. So this is uh, important. And then there are special cases uh, that are emerging nowadays in which, uh, in physics, where you have uh, helicity always zero, exactly zero, and this is, uh, again, a matter of studying. Why? Why is, uh, is exactly zero? Uh, I'm thinking again. Uh, systems, uh, yesterday I mentioned harmonic functions and the lack of defects or presence of defects, and uh, then I'm thinking again of the same thing. Uh, Bose-Einstein condensates in certain situations, helicity is exactly zero for the property of the physical system. So helicity can be used to identify properties of that, uh, of that system, uh, structural properties. 
Uh, we didn't, I just mentioned in words the word topology. We didn't talk about topology. We don't know really what is the relationship yet between uh, helicity and topology. We will talk a lot about that uh, in two days' time. But for the moment, uh, we just uh, uh, mentioned the fact that is robust as energy and uh, is there always, but uh, in particular, we can recognize it when there are localized systems, localized structures, then it's easy. It's easy because you can think of a vortex ring that maybe is linking with another vortex ring. And uh, we are going a bit fast here, but let me just speak again on the remark uh, of, uh, of, uh, that we did now, uh, the fact that uh, if there is a linkage, we cannot be in a plane, for instance. We have to, to be three-dimensional. If we push this link to a plane, uh, we're pushing helicity to be zero. So uh, although we don't know the meaning of helicity in terms of linking yet, as we are now, but we understand that helicity is measuring three-dimensionality, is robust as it is energy, it scales more or less uh, with the same order of magnitude. So if we are keen on energy, we should learn to be keen on helicity. Uh, we are saying that, although I'm anticipating the concept, that is measuring something complex, let's say. And then I add topologically complex. And this is even stronger because it doesn't matter the shape as long as it's not destroyed. And then I'm happy to join him in saying, of course, under dissipation, it gets destroyed, but it, it, it gets destroyed slowly. It survives for some time. So think of a, of a vortex, a ring linked with another one. Of course, they, they, uh, they immediately in water, you know, they, they get uh, dissipated. But the linkage of what we see with bubbles and the linkage of the field lines is a different thing. The linkage of field lines may survive, although I'm playing with uh, mathematical ideas, but I'm, I'm seriously thinking the linkage of the field lines may survive much more longer than what we see with bubbles. You know, in vortices, it's like uh, the powder I said before. We don't see vorticity. So in air, we see uh, uh, you know, some, some dust that uh, identifies a vortex region. And in water, we use bubbles, uh, tiny, tiny bubbles that are captured by low pressure field. And this low pressure field is at the core, is at the core of this vortex tube. And so the, uh, it's, it's, it sucks the bubble, the air bubble. As uh, the electrons uh, travel in uh, these uh, quantum vortices in uh, superfluids, to visualize a vortex in a superfluid, they, they just shoot electrons, and these electrons travel much faster uh, inside uh, this empty, this would be empty structure with vorticity only on the boundary, which makes also an, another interesting problem to solve. That was done by J.J. Thompson he, himself. He worked on the uh, velocity induced by a vortex uh, that has only vorticity on the boundary and is empty inside. Again, it's funny because he did it in uh, uh, 1872 and uh, you can imagine nobody cared about that result. And now we're talking about quantum vortices that are exactly like that in uh, superfluid helium. So it comes uh, useful what he did. Uh, all this to say that uh, helicity is a measure of a presence of three-dimensionality. And for its own sake, for this reason, enough is to say that is, uh, uh, is important to identify three-dimensionality and three-dimensionality that survives in certain regions. Through dissipation, you may have bulk of turbulence that is stronger to dissipate in its structure. And so uh, why helicity survives better in certain regions than others as a tracer for three-dimensional structures. And this is important because we just said that three-dimensional structures carry a lot of energy, a lot of information. Yeah, I should stop here. Uh, 
Yes. No. And this is the question that my, <laughs> my, when I, when I defended my PhD, I was very lucky because one of the, of the examiners were, one was uh, Derek Moore. Uh, Moore and Safman worked uh, together for many, many years on vortex dynamics. And, uh, and uh, I had the, Safman, the other one. Safman was a tough, tough man. And uh, uh, Safman, so you can imagine the situation. You are, you are examined by these two guys, and uh, uh, it's not an easy thing. Huh? And, uh, and with all my enthusiasm, I started talking about vortex tubes like this. And Safman asked me, he stopped me almost, uh, almost at the beginning, which is the terrible thing that you can do to a young man because you know you just start with enthusiasm and somebody comes with a killing question and he asked me, you know, this, this is a nice idea, Renzo, but uh, how do you define the vortex? Where, where is the vortex? How do you define it? And then, uh, I, you know, for years... I thought that was a tube with vorticity inside and nothing outside, and I never thought this is my definition of a vortex. So I, uh, you know, when you receive such a question, you think, "Gosh, this must be a very serious question." <laughs> so I, I started to think something, and then I came clean. I said, "Well, I don't know. This is my my definition of a vortex. Yes, but where it, this surface, where where it ends." And where is the center of the vortex? Oh, the center was even worse as a question. Because for me, so the center, I, that was an easy, easy way out. I said, that, well, the tube has a circular cross section, and that is the center. But you remember the vortex ring case, huh? Do you remember? We just mentioned uh, before. The vortex ring case, the vortex ring case, has no cross section circular. It's not circular, the cross section. The cross-section is not circular because otherwise it does not satisfy the steady vortex dynamic solution. Indeed, for the steady plasma physics solution, the grad shafranoff equation gives you a cross-section that is a D-shape. It's not circular. So to choose a torus with a circular cross-section is imposing on nature what we want to do but it's not satisfying nature because it wouldn't be a solution of the steady equation. So when I say a vortex is uh, of this uh, circular cross-section, but, but bends and uh, twists in the fluid, oh, no, no, no. Who says that the cross-section stays circular during the motion? It's not circular at all. And uh, I can uh, use the, uh, the tokamak cross-section to say that uh, it wouldn't be so, uh, <laughs> it would be obvious to think that the cross-section is flattened on the part of concavity. And then if it twists, this flattened part will rotate according to the pitch of the helix. That would probably be a steady-state solution of a twisted vortex in, the, in 3D. Now, to say that uh, the cross-section is circular, of course you understand how far I was from reality. I'm, f I'm fine, I'm okay if the, f if the vortex tube is small, as Kelvin did, very small. Okay, so I can assume that uh, the departure from perfect circularity are so small that I can neglect them. That's okay. But if the vortex is thick, who says that the, the, the cross-section is circular? Unless is perfectly, infinitely long as a, as a tube, as a cylinder, untouched, unmoved. Un... So I said that, and <laughs> he, he, he looked at me, and he said, uh -huh. I wasn't so happy. So I tried to explain the fact that at the center, I located the points where pressure is at the minimum, okay, a bit better then. 
And then uh, you insisted, he said, okay, from the low pressure region, how do you go to a point where you say it's still a vortex and then the vortex disappears? And then I didn't know. I said, well, I, it's a model, it's a mathematical model. And then some silence I thought was, I was doing very badly. And at a certain point, Moore <laughs> looked at Safman and said, it's a tough one, this one, uh, Philip, isn't it? We don't know. <laughs> oh, if they didn't know, I was relieved. So where the vortex ends uh, is uh, an assumption. You, uh, is a, you distribute the vorticity on the cross-section on a Gaussian profile. And then below a certain amount of vorticity, below a threshold that you fix, you say that is no longer a vortex. So, you, you know, it's like, uh, um, okay, uh, I'm here moving to a, a technical point, but somebody in the audience understands very well. It's like boundary layer theory. If you are, you know, you take uh, above uh, a certain, uh, you know, you go below a certain region where vorticity or velocity, let's say, below when uh, the velocity is 90, is, point, uh, is 1 percent of the velocity uh, in the bulk of the fluid, then you are uh, really uh, at, the, at, the, at the level of the boundary, of the solid boundary. And you define a boundary in that, in that sense. So it's boundary layer theory. So you say when it's below a certain amount, then there is no more vorticity. But you are right, vorticity is everywhere. Is everywhere, so it survives everywhere. And uh, the question of identifying topology more easily is always there, but uh, more easily is when you say, okay, suppose you have a vorticity highly localized. Let me go back again to the analogy with magnetic fields. Same thing. You, they sent satellites, and they sent satellites to measure uh, these uh, structures, so to speak, and uh, of course uh, ions are everywhere, but uh, uh, you threshold the amount of uh, uh, electric and magnetic properties, and you, you see very well, now you go on the internet, there are plenty of pictures, it's not uh, simulations, these are real pictures from, uh, from data from uh, satellite analysis, uh, the SOHO satellite or many other so trace satellites, etc. You see beautiful structures that are interacting. And these structures you can say that uh, here is a plasma loop and here is none. Then there are quantities uh, well known like uh, the Reynolds number and you can measure the Reynolds number which is a, a ratio between uh, inertia and dissipation. And uh, when a dissipation is very small compared to inertia, you say this is a region of ideal fluid, as you can say is a region of uh, uh, zero vorticity compared to the vorticity. Same thing. Same for magnetic fields, of course. You introduce a magnetic Reynolds number. When this magnetic Reynolds number is very large, and the Reynolds number in the solar corona, uh, when... Uh, uh, when I'm thinking of solar corona, I'm thinking of magnetic fields embedded almost in an ideal fluid. We're talking Reynolds number of 10 to 9, 10 to 10, 10 to 8. It means that in the equation, you have Euler equation plus the viscous term. You can rewrite this equation. When, uh, when you rewrite this equation, you have uh, your Euler, Euler, Plus, and this is, uh, say, dissipation, magnetic effect, etc., etc. And this, this dissipation, let's say, dissipation, dissipative effects divided by Reynolds number. You see? These are the equations. So you, you can imagine to take measure, take measure. If the Reynolds number is 10 to 8, who is going to care uh, the sixth or seventh decimal point, decimal point of your digits. Nobody cares. And this is the, the Reynolds number in the solar corona, 10 to 8, 10 to... 
so in, in, uh, in, in fluids, I don't know, but it depends. 10 to 3, 10 to 4. So if it is slow, if it is slow, cl low, then clearly, uh, then, then you go to the other extreme. You, you go to the extreme. So it's a very important extreme, the other one. I'm not talking about the other one because uh, we have uh, one week. But what about the other one? Honey, very viscous, very viscous fluid. Very interesting. You know why? There is a reason. There is always a reason. This world is booming. So before we thought of internet as a way to uh, think of topology that is important and conservation laws, etc. Uh, but uh, for, for viscous fluids, uh, comes to mind uh, uh, genetics, DNA, DNA polymers. Uh, there are enzymes, topo enzyme, topological enzymes, topoisomerases, and they knot and link a long chain. And this long chain is not only a polymer, which is also important for polymer physics, but it can be a DNA. It can be a DNA, a knotted DNA. And you understand very well from your intuition that if it, is, if it gets knotted, then uh, is killing, right? Killing factor, because it cannot duplicate. If it gets knotted, it cannot duplicate and form a secondary uh, DNA from the first. The RNA cannot uh, duplicate correctly, so it's a killer for life. So this can be used by viruses. They attack, they disentangle stuff, they entangle stuff, they reproduce themselves, and so on and so forth. This is done by topoisomerases. That's why topology in modern DNA genetics is a very important business right now. So um, that's another way to see it. But the simple experiment uh, uh, can be done in any lab, any small scale, poor money lab. You take, uh, you take a cord of one meter long, say, and then you knot it, and then you close the ends, right? And then you leave this cord sedimenting in a viscous fluid, okay? And you measure time. You can measure time. It sediments over a, a meter height, it goes down, and is knotted. And now you tie a different knot type, and then more knots, and then you study uh, the sedimentation of this uh, same cord, a piece of cord, uh, according to the, the, the number, the, the types of knots you knotted, and also the number of knots you may, the more you knotted and the more compact it becomes. So the so-called wet surface, the surface of the physical cord that is wetted by water becomes less and less so, so it sediments faster. And you have an energy spectrum, a spectrum of sedimentation according to knot type. Again, topology is discretizing energy. It's an, another interesting uh, strand of research of modern applications of uh, topological ideas to fluid flows. Very important. Very important for a number of reasons. There is one other reason. So I'm, I'm going to use your time to anticipate what I'm going to do in the, the last two days, that is also extremely interesting, is uh, remote from our interest, maybe, but uh, is uh, the following. Um, <clears throat> suppose uh, uh, you go back in time and you are an engineer of uh, 150 years ago, and you think of a metal, how to improve the properties of a metal. So you go to a chemist, and the chemist of the time said, well, you do a mixing, of iron with some other uh, substance, and the metal gets uh, highly improved. And you understand what I mean by that. You know, you have uh, uh, the, a combination of uh, chemical elements in uh, a melt in a, in a big bulk of one metal, of one element, and then uh, you increase uh, uh, mechanical properties, in particular the young modulus. So mechanical properties greatly improved. But then uh, the strength of m modern research is, uh, well, I don't want to uh, get spurious, spurious quantities in the bulk of the metal. I want to increase uh, the mechanical properties just by having an entanglement of the structure of the same molecule, 
for example, of the same crystalline structure. So these are recent works in that direction. Uh, for example, with magnetic fields, I can entangle the magnetic field so that I can structure my system, and uh, that can be used to trap information or to release or to convey information. Again, all this has to do with three-dimensional aspects. And then I stop just mentioning the big and big problem. And the big and big problem is neurobiology. Neurobiology, you know, you give a drug uh, to a tissue, especially on Alzheimer, etc. And the drug helps uh, uh, the nervous uh, connections to, uh, to restructure. So you have benefit. And why people are not happy? Why the drug is not enough? The drug is not enough because what you get is a rather ordered system. You lack of three-dimensionality. And you don't know how to induce a homogeneous disorder, so to speak. You understand what I mean by that? Because I don't mean really disorder. Otherwise, uh, our brain wouldn't work properly either. But I mean a, a way where I would feel all the space or the space uh, full of oxygen and ingredients, etc., would help me to survive in a way like a tree, uh, so uh, to optimize energy, but also to communicate rapidly to very different parts of the same system. And th for, for doing that, you need to understand how to increase three-dimensionality and uniformly distribute the disorder, so to speak. So the first step, the crude step, is at least to get a, a uniform disorder in three dimensions. And then the next step would be, once you achieve that, how to organize the disorder so to be efficient in terms of communication. This is uh, a new approach and is called the topological neurobiology. Okay, well, thank you for your attention. You've been very patient. <laughs> so shall we just stop here? Yes, we stop here. And uh, tomorrow, uh, magnetic fields. So we switch to MHD and uh, magnetic helicity. And then we are very close to linking numbers, the last lecture. So following the program I gave you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah.